The Power of Dehumanization. I'm Terry Kiley. In the last century, it is estimated that 262 million people were killed in genocides in the world. That would be equivalent to killing over 80% of the current U.S. population. While each one of these historical situations were different, there is also a lot of similarity in the way the population was prepared for it. For genocide to take place, you have to have lots of willing actors, people who support those actions, and for many others to remain silent or in denial about what's happening. There are many scholars working to understand the patterns of communication that prepare the way for such terror and tragedy. One of them is Jonathan Leader Maynard, Several nonprofit organizations as well are working to help promote his work and do practical trainings and work on the ground to help interrupt genocidal dynamics. Now, the technical term for the process that prepares people for mass violence is dangerous speech. You will notice, though, that in my public speeches, I often use the word dehumanization for this process as it is more widely used as a term. In Maynard's work, dehumanization is the second step in the process of dangerous speech. This is an example of how effective public messaging may be different from the work of, of academics, even though we rely on academics to help us. Both are important. So in the process of dangerous speech, first, people with some influence propose an us and a them. This divides the population into in-groups and out-groups. It takes the larger we, and splits it up so that we see the common good as only applying or primarily applying to our own group. The second step is to promote dehumanizing language about the group. The group is associated with animals, bugs, disease, and danger. They are said to be not quite fully human, either because of some genetic trait or a cultural conditioning. If they're not fully human, then the rules that apply to how we treat other humans don't apply to them. The third step is to apply collective blame to the group for individual or small group violence. This individual or small group is framed as revealing the true intentions of the larger group. Often, this is accompanied by attempts to say that there might be some good members of that group, but mostly they are all the same. Positive examples are framed as the group attempting to cover up their bad intent with deceptive good deeds. These previous steps lead to a fourth stage in which the group is seen as a threat. The fear becomes real, even if the threat is not, or even if the threat is overblown. Fear closes down our normal brain functioning, our capacity to analyze a situation. The fear is based, usually, on what we love. So leaders of dangerous speech process use what we love against us to divide us from one another and to generate violence. Once many members of a society are fearful, the terrible logic of genocide is applied with messages that there is no alternative. But to engage in violence against the other group, because they will do it to us, so we must strike first. Options for bridge building and peacemaking are framed as cowardly or naive. A closely related next step is to promote violence as necessary and good. And here we must pause for a moment to reflect on the fact that most of the people who engage in the actual work or support of genocide do not think they're doing evil. Many former Nazis still believed until their own death that they were engaged in necessary and even good actions. We are all capable of being convinced that violence is necessary and good. All of us, including me. Lastly, a vision of a peaceful future is proposed, but a future that can only come if we engage in violence now. The reality is that assuming the worst about other groups brings out the worst in us. One of the most profound and disturbing realizations for me in the last six years is how the same techniques of dangerous speech are used to maintain the caste system based on racism. 
violence is not just expressed in genocide, but also in enslavement, exploitation, denial of opportunity, and basic services. Not only are we all potentially capable of being deceived and manipulated by dangerous speech, we all have been. Let me repeat that. We all have been deceived and manipulated that way. My work to counter the dehumanization of Muslims has helped me to see that I have been raised in a larger culture that dehumanizes indigenous, black, brown, Asian, LGBTQIA+, people with differing abilities, and so many more. Irvin Staub teaches us that a key factor in determining whether or not a society will walk the road of dangerous speech and mass violence is whether people move from being passive bystanders to being active ones. Opposition from bystanders, whether based on moral or other grounds, can change the perspective of perpetrators and other bystanders, especially if these active bystanders act at an early point on the continuum of destruction. That's from Irvin Staub's Roots of Goodness. In other words, people engaged in authentic allyship can contribute to the interruption of violence, especially when they are from the majority in-group, because folk will listen to them. In the course, we will be offering a process that you can use to counter dangerous speech in our Communicating for Change part of the course. One of the key questions you have to answer in this course is whether or not you want to do the work of moving from being a passive ally to one that is being an active ally or to use Irvin Staub's words, from a passive bystander to an active bystander, and interrupt the process of dangerous speech and mass violence, and help all of us create a more peaceful world. That's up to you.